Please raise your hands. Yes, completely, 100%. And how much does the entire QA department of yours trust your automation? No hands? One hand. And how much does your management trust your automation? Yeah? OK, that's nice. So without trust, we don't really collaborate. We merely coordinate, or at best, cooperate. It is trust that transforms a group of people into a team. I like this quote because it points out the importance of not just going to work. Like You spend 9 to 5 at work, and you want to add some meaning to the work that you do, along with the people you spend most of the time with, right? You just don't want to go there and listen to someone and do something, just cooperate without you liking it. You want to have that team building experience with everyone and enjoy your time at work. Because you go to work because you're passionate about the work, and you want to let everyone know the kind of work that you're doing. So I welcome you all to Building the Blocks of Trust in Automation. I am Sneha Vishwalingam, and a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a test automation engineer. And I have worked on setting up automation frameworks in two companies so far, and moving on to the third one when I right when I get back from here. This is my thank you. This is my LinkedIn profile. I don't have a Twitter handle yet. I need to work on it. But this is how I connect with people. So feel free to connect with me. And if you have any questions, just ping me, and I will definitely respond to you. So I'm happy to see so many of you here, and I'm very humbled. What are your expectations out of this talk? Like, what did you have in mind when you came in? What do you want to take away with you from this talk? Say something. No expectations at all? How do I, <clears throat> how do I build up the expectation with not me? You would have read the proposal. You would have read the summary of the talk. What, what, what came to your mind when you read that? And what made you come to this room to attend this talk? Nice. You're on the right track. Cool. Maybe you're on the right track. <laughs> Let's see. I'm sure you'll gain something out of it. I'm sure you'll take, take back something out of this. Uh, moving on. So having followed some best practices from the previous Selenium conference talks, my team was able to shift from flaky tests to stable, reliable automation tests. And during that time, I learned the importance of actually trusting uh, in your test suite to unite the team as a whole. And once you start trusting your test suite, it becomes crucial for the software development lifecycle as well. So this talk is going to be about our journey in building that and how we involved the entire organization in the process. So we're going to talk about building trust among the automation engineers, among the QA team, and having the management actually believe in us and trust us. So a little bit of background of what a company wanted. Uh, this company that I got into was looking to an embrace automation from a fully manual QA environment. So they did not have any automation in place. So the goal was to provide an easily maintainable and extensible framework that would enable the team to contribute to automation. So we wanted a framework that is easy to adapt by even non-technical people in the team so that we could involve all of them in the organization. So the journey began. We went ahead with the, the BDD approach using SpecFlow and Selenium WebDriver with C Sharp. Um, if, we, if you haven't heard SpecFlow before, um, it's Cucumber for .NET. So it's very similar. The concepts are very similar to Cucumber. And uh, it's an open source solution trusted by the .NET devs around the world. That's what the website says. And uh, ours was a Microsoft shop, so we used Team Foundation Server for continuous integration. And we used Gemini for uh, the project management. And uh, if you're not aware of Gemini, it's like the younger brother of Jira. It works. And, uh, and then we uh, 
had nicely scheduled builds, and then we had screenshots, we had reports, and we had logs, and we had get data management. We had everything that needed that was needed for a decent automation framework to be good. And uh, we trained two of the manual testers who had a good programming background to help us with automation. So we were a team of the three of us working on automation. Everything was going good. We developed some tests and uh, everything was fancy. Everyone was happy with how the automation was going on until we started getting test cases. We started getting some Christmas lights. Not these lights. I would have been very happy if I got these. But then we started getting these. So what helped? We knew that we had to do something about it and come up with some strategies to deal with it. So we started with attacking the flaky test because flaky tests um, are the fastest way to lose trust. All it takes is just one flaky test to spoil the trust. So what we did was we separated the failing tests from the successful tests. We kept them under observation so that we knew that all the tests that were in the build that was running in the continuous annotation were going to succeed. And if it fails, it's because there is a genuine uh, defect in the app and not because of flaky tests or it's not because of us, it's because of them. So, so we uh, kept the flaky tests under observation and we kept working on them and we started adding some uh, table identifiers and then we added some intelligent weights. So basically what we did was we worked on them um, within our team so that the others could trust the automation because we're not giving them bad tests, we're giving them good tests, right? So, um, and then the main aim was to, uh, and then the main aim was to maintain the build always green unless there was a change to the app. That way everyone trusts this feedback. And while working on the flaky test, if we had some uh, locator issues and we weren't able to add the right elements and locators, we would just talk to the developers and ask them to help us out because um, it's a team effort. They should help us help them as well, right? So uh, we didn't shy away from talking to the developers. They probably hate us now, but it just helps us uh, trust our automation even more. And then what we did was don't use Selenium unnecessarily just because you can use it. We were using Selenium to set up uh, prereq data as well. It was the data that is supposed to be in the app, but just because we could use Selenium, we just wiped away everything and used, sel used Selenium to build the data from scratch, and all the tests were dependent on those. So there was a lot of dependency that we were adding. So what we did was we added the data to the database and just restore the database whenever we wanted to run those tests against it. So what you can do is, this is something that worked for us. Maybe, maybe you could add the REST API calls and then um, use, use what, use what uh, works for you in your organization. For us, having our software in consideration, this is what uh, that worked best for us. But the idea is, do not use Selenium just because you can use it. Use it where you really have to use it and use it where it really helps you the most. And then direct URLs. So we had a lot of places where we had to navigate to a lot of buttons to reach to a page. That was also giving a lot of flakiness because of timeout issues and it was just leading to unnecessary complications. So we just added direct URLs. We obviously parameterized them and all that, but we added direct URLs in places where we had to navigate a lot, lot unnecessarily because that's definitely not something that we are very interested in testing. We're interested in going to the page and testing what's there in the page. Um, then keep the test short. You don't want to test, um, yeah, keep the test short. You don't want to test, you don't want tests in which each step depends on uh, the other tests, right? So you break your flow down into small, manageable, and independent step cases so that there is less dependency. And that way, if one test fails, it won't make the whole test suite come to a halt. You can still proceed, and you still get feedback, and you get short of feedback. And that way, you can effectively increase your test coverage at each execution of your test cases. 
So yeah, the aim is to maintain the build green always unless there's a change in the app. That was the goal that we had in mind and that really helped us. And this is essentially what we did. We just disabled them, not completely. We put them in a different test suite where we are working on them continuously. The idea was to work on it until it succeeds completely for like 10 to 20 runs. And then when we are very confident about those tests, we would move those tests into the test suite. Test. That way, uh, it's not because of the flaky nature. I mean, I know flakiness happens, but if it runs successfully for 20 runs, I'm sure the flakiness is solved. And we can trust those builds after that. And this is a tip that I got from a presentation from one of the Selenium conference. So there are so many things that we in included fr from the talks from the Selenium conferences that really helped us. It, it might be just small, small tips, but it makes a huge difference when you implement it at work. Code reviews. Um, so we set some standards for code reviews. Initially, we, were very, we weren't very strict about code reviews. We would just see if everything was fine and just merge them, which was a big fault. And uh, later, when we had all these issues, we set some standards for code reviews, and we followed the footsteps of the devs. And they had some template steps, so we adopted that from them. And then we had our own rules set for all making code reviews as well. It started with this. Having uh, all the common values in the config nation file. So we used a config file to store common lead values across the project. And then we extracted the common logic and made a separate function which others can invoke. And then we made sure that we avoided repeating the same test in multiple test cases, which definitely helps avoid redundancy. These are, these are small things to take care of, but these are very uh, necessary when, it, when the test case starts getting bigger and you want to maintain it in a very efficient way. And then we, um, no documentation, a big no. This is something we really stressed on uh, because people are constantly moving and when someone new comes and if there's no documentation, especially with test cases and scaling tests, it's very difficult to figure out what's what. So we made sure that we have, all, we, all of us put in documentation, even if, I mean, not 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 so much, but even if a small child wants to read it, he can understand what it is. Um, and then relative path always, that is something that all of us are following by default. And if you're not able to get relative path, again, go and bug your developers to help, help you fix that issue. And then readme files. I didn't understand the importance of readme files before, but one of my colleagues really took the effort and made this beautiful readme file. And ever since, it has been so good for us. Um, so each pro project should have a readme file, and this file should include any external dependencies, URLs, setup um, instructions, node configurations, and values that need to be changed for a local machine and all that. And decorate your code with lots of comments and uh, make your code more readable and maintainable in the long run. And basically think of coding as an art. You just decorate it and just make it as legible and uh, beautiful as you can. And this book is was basically our code bible. Uh, if you haven't read this before, please add it to your reading list. Uh, it has really helped my team to be able to achieve clean code. And uh, it was very useful. I cannot stress enough on the fact that please add it to your reading list if you want to write clean, legible code. Now let's move on to building trust among the QA team. Communication. So we noticed that our manual testers did not have a clear picture of what was automated. Sometimes we would see them regressing tests that are already automated. And that is useless because this is wasting time and wasting your effort and it's just not trusting automation. And that's not what we want. And that was partly because we didn't communicate well enough. And if you're not trusting, then it's something that we did as well. I'm sorry. So, so we addressed the communication gap issues. Um, and as communication is key, we scheduled um, sharing sessions in our weekly routines. Both automation and manual testing team should be active participants and jointly plan 
the testing tasks of each project. And we, we would run all the automation, and uh, they'll take a look at it, and then they'll tell us if you're missing anything, if you're missing some test cases. And, um, and then they are the subject matter experts, and they know the ins and outs, right, of the, of the software. So it was necessary even for us to run it through them and make sure um, they felt like all the tests were covered correctly. And, um, and then the tools for the job. So having an integrated test management environment was the best way to keep the test coverages in check. We've used the test trail, and we've even used Excel sheets. Uh, just mark, make sure you mark all of them as automated. And that way, they have a clear idea of uh, what are the tests that are automated and what are the tests that may need to regress. And um, yeah, and TestRail has some, uh, and all, all of these tools have some cool way to find metrics that you could use to, before, before the release. So collaboration with manual testers. As I said, uh, they are the ones who know the ins and outs of the system, and they know the business-centric tips and tricks. They know what kind of test data would be needed for what test, et cetera. So we wanted to leverage their skills into automation. And so we had all the automation test, manual testers write feature files and then attach them to the tickets. Uh, feature files, if you're not aware of, is a part of the spec flow, like the BDD scenario. Um, so the training. How do we train our manual testers to write feature files? We basically explained how feature files fit into our automation structure. We had workshops where we had them train in our automation framework. We would, we would show them the entire flow of how we create a test and how we generate step files and how we write pages for those step files. And then, so, and then when they write feature files and they add them as attachments to the ticket, we would take the feature files and generate steps and write pages. But we trained them, like we had workshops to let them know just for them to understand how everything fits in place so that they have a detailed knowledge on what they're doing. So tools like SpecFlow are created to enable non-technical people to participate in development directly. But then expecting the same people to use Visual Studio or Eclipse to write feature files is not a fair expectation, in my opinion. Because sometimes they know more about the domain, and they're not necessarily very interested in learning about IDEs and tools. You know? So instead of asking them to learn the IDE, it seemed like a better option to look for ways to serve the same purpose of enabling the team in writing feature files. So they found this um, app called uh, Tidy Gulkin. It's a Chrome app. It's very easy to it's, it's it's very easy to install, and you don't require an IDE for that. It is free, and it is very very lightweight. So uh, it it was very easy for our manual testers to use this to write feature files. And honestly, not all the manual testers are open to learning automation. They are excellent in their field and they're happy with that. They don't want to move into automation, but there are some people who are very excited and who really want to move into automation. So if you want to get something out of someone, you need to give them easier ways to listen to you or help you out um, with what you want. So that was the reason why we wanted Tidy Gherkin, why we implemented, we used Tidy Gherkin while uh, training the manual testers. Um, I will show you how Tidy Gherkin looks after the talk, and we'll just go through a small demo of Tidy Gherkin. Documentation. Technical documentation is basically an invaluable resource. Everyone knows about it. No one really uses it unless they really are interested but it is still an invaluable uh, resource. You can use anything for documentation, but it's important to have easy access uh, to the documentation. For example, uh, you have options like Confluence, or you can make your own website and maintain documentation there, or you can even have Word documents and put them in a common folder where everyone accesses it. Whatever works for you, but make sure um, keep it up to date, and uh, we tried to do that. I wouldn't say we did it every, every week or anything, but we tried our best to keep our documents up to date. 
And I've used Confluence before, and it is so much better to collaborate online and work on documentation with set templates. Uh, when you have the collaboration going on, when, so, when something makes it so easy for you to collaborate, I think it encourages the team to go off in and up to date, uh, like update all the documentation. So that is how we kind of um, collaborated with all the manual testers and help the manual testers help us. And, and, then, and then we used to have standoffs in the morning where we would tell the reports, where, where, we would, where we would tell the report updates and all that. So it was like, it was a good uh, collaboration uh, for us. Now, how do you get your management to trust us? Yeah, marketing automation is kind of a big deal. Because if you don't market it, no one knows about it, all your effort goes to waste. Benefits of automation are basically fasting testing, faster testing cycles, improved test coverage, and ability to catch bugs earlier. But you know about this, but how do you, how do you get this across to the management? Because all they need is proof. Without proof, they won't believe you. So what sells to management is basically money, metrics, and visibility. The money part of it, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we can help. Maybe faster, maybe, they need to figure it out. I really don't know how we can help. But the metrics and visibility part, we can surely help. Collect metrics. What kind of metrics do you collect? So we collect uh, test metrics, test basically test coverage, test progress curve, that's the measure of the breadth of the functional coverage that you've, you've had so far. And then determine by comparing the number of successful tests to the total number of tests that need to be completed for a given project. And if your coverage is poor, you have to address this issue immediately. And they want to know that. They want to make strategies depending on how the situation is. So metrics really help them. Defect metrics. Defect in the final product versus defects reported. Defect turnaround time. So that's, that's basically the ratio of the number of pre-delivery defects versus the number of post-delivery defects. That is, that is a metric that you really need to know to understand how well they are performing in the team. Next, uh, we talk about visibility. How to increase the visibility of automation in the organization. So how many of you already use wall boards in your company? Nice, that's a good number. So for those of you who don't know or don't use wall boards, it's a visual aid that displays a real time metric that we are interested in. So we could uh, configure whatever uh, widgets that we are interested in seeing on a day to day basis and have them at the wall board. Uh, it's a large display of information and it's con continuously updated and it's usually located in a place where the whole team can see, right? So why do we have wall boards? Uh, you could just walk into the office and see the state of the build. No more digging into email reports, no more trying to figure out from the junk in your email of what is the actual report that you're looking for. If you know what I mean, like there are so many emails that you get from TFS and you have to figure out which one you're interested in and all that, uh, you just need to look over your monitor to see the metrics, right? And uh, it is kind of a double-edged sword if your automation is not set in place very, very well, because that's like openly saying, um, oh, so many, so many tests failed. And everyone's going to be behind your back for the entire day about why the test failed. But instead, if you just had it in your email, it's just your headache to figure out why it failed, and you can figure it out but there's so much pressure coming from the entire company because the whole world knows that your test failed and something is wrong. Um, so be careful when you do that, and if you don't want the entire organization to come behind you, maybe you could initially start with having wall boards only for your team, then for your QA team, and then if you're very confident, go and keep it in your CEO's office or do whatever you want, but be very careful when you go ahead to that step. Then brown bag sessions, and how many of you have brown bag sessions regularly in your company. So what are the topics that you cover in your brown bag sessions? 
I'm, I'm very curious to know what are the topics that you could cover in round back session. I saw some hands somewhere over there. Okay, that's nice. So, for the ones who don't know what brown bag sessions are or don't have brown bag sessions in your company, it's just another form of communication that's used within the group. Um, to uh, for visibility purposes and just for discussions and presentations and workshops and so on. And uh, the presenter at a brown bag session will be aware that the participants will be eating their lunches. If you know the history of brown bag, it, that's why it's called brown bag sessions because they have the lunches and brown bags, sandwiches and Pepsi and all that, and then they come into the session. They'll be eating their lunches and the presenter just presents something. It's a very informal session. So the topics typically in brown bag sessions are something that you, it'll be nice to know, but it's not something that you really, really need to know, right? So it's an informal meeting and all that. And why do we have brown bag sessions? Again, for visibility. Uh, the topic itself doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's about your personal preference, and obviously the entire organization doesn't want or technical deep dive on Selenium web driver. They're not going to gain anything out of it. Um, but they would be open to hearing some latest developments in the field of automation, right? And on how you plan on implementing them at work. And if you give too much details on the technical aspect, like Selenium grid, um, where, the, where the unit tests that you used, and uh, how you how you're going to implement how you're going to implement them is fine, but just general topics on technical deep dives is they're not going to they're not going to like it and they're, they're going to get bored very easily, and they're just going to say that this automation team is so full of themselves. So so be careful when you choose your topics. Choose some nice general topics that they'd be interested in listening to, and that also relates to your automation. Then attending networking events. Attend meetups, conferences, workshops, etc. Um, it is good for the industry because um, you will no doubt return from an event, workshop, or conference with an abundance of fresh knowledge and likely a burning desire to implement all of what you have learned in the in the in the conference. And your organization is going to like it. Who doesn't like positive energy? Who doesn't like people who brings in fresh ideas of what they've learned? So I understand sometimes attending conferences, workshops would be expensive, but attending meetups is free. So you'd be very interested uh, to know what are the kind of topics that, that you can actually learn from the meetups. And you can have wonderful brainstorming sessions out of those and um, inject inspiration into the work culture. So there, there are so many advantages out of attending networking events, and I'm sure you're um, your work would also encourage such activities. So putting all these blocks together, oh, and just in case if you haven't noticed, we had color schemes in the, in the presentation. Uh, so this is like putting all those blocks together. Uh, so putting these blocks of strategies together has helped my team gain confidence, not only with the tests we wrote, but also within each other, because there was a lot of collaboration and there was a lot of working together and there was a lot of transparency above all. Um, when you're transparent with each other, you actually trust each other. So I hope that you could relate to at least a few strategies from this talk um, that you could actually implement within your team to help build trust. Even if not exactly what we did, you could map what we did into something that fits uh, into your company and something that would benefit you. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? What about the demo? Oh, yeah. Remember that everything, testing in production always fails. <laughs>
this is how Tidy Gherkin looks. It's very easy to download. Let me show it to you. Just go to this and uh, install it. I already installed it, so just launch app. And it opens up the app. This is how it looks. And you could easily insert the template and you could write your feature here. So I'm just writing something. Um, And then you write your scenarios here. And then you insert your scenario outline. Don't worry about the, uh, uh, the template out output because you see it tidies it down. That's the beauty of tidy working. And then you just keep adding how many other scenarios that you want and write your test cases over here. And then you just, well, you save this. It saves as a dot .feature file. That way you could just attach this feature file to your ticket and uh, write whatever you want in the ticket. And then it comes to the automation engineer. We just have to use the feature file as it is, or sometimes make changes according to automation standards, and then work with it. See how much time it saves, because then you have to, like, see all the specifications in the ticket without, without the tidy gherkin, um, and then try to figure out what they mean, and then write our own test cases out of it. But instead, you have a living documentation over here that you could just use and uh, use it right away. That's it for now. Any questions? Can I? What was that? Oh, uh, can you make it a little bit bigger? Probably change change the resolution down. So do you have any questions for me? Hi, what about scenario outline? Scenario outline. Okay. You got scenario, but how to get scenario outline? Over here. With examples. Examples. Do you we need to mention data. Yes. Um, scenario means for single time execution, scenario outline for uh, data driven. Oh, yeah. Uh, how to and give then data? You could, you could just insert your tables over here. Like you could have your rows and columns and then insert, insert, insert table and, uh, and then like given your data. So this is how you add data to this. And then it automatically becomes all pretty because it just tidies it up down. And when you save your feature file, that's how it saves. Examples colon not required, right? Examples colon not required, right? No, you could just remove it. Okay. It, it depends on you. If you want to give examples, you can ha add examples. Okay. Of Actually, we are using Eclipse with Cucumber plugin. Okay. So definitely we need to mention examples colon before okay. giving data. Thank you. Can I, and now, now? All right. Uh, 
I was wanting to know how you handle code reviews when you're producing these these tests. Uh, for the uh, feature flags written by manual testers? Yes. Okay. That basically just comes to us and we change it according to our automation needs. We don't have code reviews for that because we're just attaching it to the tickets. And we take that and make the necessary changes for us to implement them in the automation. Are there changes to the step definitions that need to be, need to undergo some sort of review? Uh, step definitions are made by us. Oh, okay. It's just the feature files that they send to us. Okay. Yeah. Great. I have another question. Um, so uh, building trust in automation, uh, maybe in a starting exercise, uh, when you start doing and it starts following up, but then uh, did you feel that it's like continuous process because by the time you have the, the trust in uh, automation for one release, the next release is going to be get ready. And if, if it involves a lots of UI changes and uh, it's going to change everything and again tests are going to become flaky. So what are the things or tips you would say, you would uh, suggest to actually uh, communicate with developers in initial phase itself so that uh, we don't uh, like having rework everything again? Yeah, if, if there's a lot of changes, we would come to know already that this release is gonna have a lot of changes, so be prepared for that. So we try to figure out what are the places that we can expect the changes in, and we, we keep ourselves um, alert in those places, and we try to work on them. Yeah. So that starts when the development starts yeah. simultaneously? Yeah. But then uh, it, it's, it's gonna be changing till it actually gets released, so how you keep? That is the, the thing with automation, speed. right? You, you mm -hmm. automate something and then it changes and then you change. So what we do is we automate it when we know that it's completely done and it's ready for testing and the manual testers have already taken a look at it once and then it comes to automation. And that's one more, one more thing why it was nice for manual testers to write feature files because they've already tested it once while they've written test cases for us. So when it comes to us, we know that these things are working and we are automating something that's already working and we'll be able to catch it if it stops working. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Any more questions? We can have probably one more last question. No? All right, Sneha, uh, thanks a lot. And brown bag is something I'm going to take away and I'm going to implement in my workplace as well. So thanks for that tip. Thank you. Thank you.